Thank you, Henry, and thank all of you for being here today. The thing that Henry didn't tell you is that you can't get elected commissioner in Coos County if you can't prove that you graduated from high school there. So I had a leg up on anybody else who was interested in running that was from outside the area. <laughs> if we could just get a show of hands really quick. How many of you are from a rural area? All right. Thank you. And how many of you consider yourselves to be from an urban area? All right. Thank you very much. I guess it's a nice idea of what the mix is in the room. Um, as you can see, we have a, a nice big panel for you today, and they have a lot to say. So I'm not going to talk too long so you can hear them. Um, we're going to go ahead and start. I'm going to have them go down the row and introduce themselves. And then after we're done with that, we'll go ahead and have some opening statements, and we'll leave time for questions at the end before you all get up and run off to go get a good seat for lunch. Um, a little bit about Coos County. It's a rural county in southern Oregon on the coast. If you were driving there, it would take you about four hours from here. I like to tell people we go to Eugene and then we turn towards the west. And that will pretty much get you to Coos County, depending on how the roads are. Uh, our demographics, about 60,000 people in Coos County. Uh, we're pleased to have an increasing growth estimate for the next 10 years, but it, it's something like 0.02%. So it's not impressive, but it is a plus, which we're glad to see. Uh, if you've heard about Coos County on the news, you've probably heard about it because we are the co-host to the Elliott State Forest along with Douglas County, and we are also the home of the proposed Jordan Cove LNG export facility. In 1990, our primary industries were timber, fishing, and wood products manufacturing. At this point, our largest employers are tourism, healthcare, and government. So it's been a big change in the last 30 years. I graduated from high school the year after the Spotted Owl was listed. So I can tell you that there's been a lot of changes in Coos County in that time. Um, we've gotten better places to eat, but we've also gotten a lot more people that are in need of social services. In, as far as Coos County government goes, in 2000 we had over 500 employees um, due to you know cuts in timber production and, of course, lower taxes. We have a little over 300 employees now. This panel is going to talk about the difficulty in trying to balance economic development and sustainability while still thinking about you know, what's right for the environment and how to preserve um, a good quality of life for our citizens. It's a very difficult topic. It's a topic that they all struggle with every day, balancing the needs of urban and rural Oregon. And, um, and we've had some really interesting conversations about the innovative ways that they've attempted to bridge that gap. I'm really looking forward to you all having a chance to hear what they have to say. I've had a chance to talk to most of them in the last few weeks. They're a great group. And with no further ado, I will let them go ahead and start introducing themselves. Senator Dembro. Thanks very much, Melissa. So I'm Michael Dembro, and yes, I live on the razor's edge of the urban-rural divide. Uh, <laughs> we'll talk more about that. I represent uh, a district very close to here, northeast, southeast Portland, uh, and I chair the Senate's uh, Committee on the Environment and Natural Resources. Thank you. Well, good morning. I'm Ken Helm. I'm a, a representative for House District 34, which is um, parts of Beaverton, Hills, uh, a little bit of Hillsboro, uh, Rock Creek, West Haven, and West Slope. So I have a little bit of Portland and then um, some of the, the, one of the best suburban cities in the region. <laughs> my name is Jim Rue. Um, as one of my commissioners pointed out uh, our conversation here today is about balance of conservation and development. Uh, fortunately, I happen to be the director of the Department of Land Conservation and Development, uh, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Thanks. Hi. Hey there, uh, Ed Fenley. I work in the uh, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Office of Sustainable Community, so I bring you greetings from the federal government. Thank you for not giggling. Um, <laughs> and uh, my office uh, works in partnership with communities. We work uh, nationally uh, uh, out of Washington, D.C. to uh, help uh, communities develop in ways that are good for the natural environment. And we have been particularly um, upping our work in small towns around the country of late. 
Good morning, everyone. I'm also with the federal government. <laughs> my, um, my name is Kevin Warner, and I work for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, where I am two months into my role as the director of the Northwest Fisheries Science Center up in Seattle. And good morning. I'm Richard Whitman. I'm the director of the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. Oh. Hello, I'm Lou Frederick. I'm a state senator for District 22. That's north and northeast Portland. Um, it would be more. Di it would be difficult to find a more urban district, but I also happen to be the, the my district also happens to have the airport in it. So if you flew in, you came into my district. <laughs> and good morning, uh, everyone. I'm uh, Representative David Brock Smith. I'm um, a representative from Southwest Oregon that encompasses all of Curry, about 75 percent of Coos a portion of Douglas and uh, a portion half of Josephine County. I encompass all of the Rogue Siskiyou National Forest and uh, fish farm and forestry uh, gearing now towards uh, economic development through tourism. Uh, and so I wanted to balance out the Portland segment of the panel. <laughs> all right. Senator Dimbro, would you like to tell us about life on the razor's edge? Sure. All right. Can I just sit here? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great. So this was a, a very good session, I think, looking back in terms of uh, showing our legislative commitment to rural economic development. Um, but uh, and I'll give some examples of some of the legislation that we passed that kind of points in that direction. Uh, but uh, before I do, I want to. Well, first give you a little bit of insider baseball and then external baseball. Mm -hmm. So many of you um, probably don't know that this was actually a very successful session for us in the Oregon Senate in terms of building bipartisan relations. I don't know if that story has been told. Um, you may remember, those of you who follow this stuff, that we had a very rough short session last time, 2016, in terms of uh, you know, the, uh, the family relations uh, between the, the Republicans and the Democrats. And um, it was really uh, much better this session, much, much more productive. And I will use myself as a personal example of that. Um, I, um, at the uh, end of uh, that short session, uh, relations between me and my good uh, Republican colleague, Fred Gerard from Staten, were so bad that Fred, re he moved his desk to the other side of the chamber. Um, <laughs> and then uh, this session, we partnered on two very important pieces of legislation, and I'll, I'll talk about one of them. Uh, and I think that was uh, kind of emblematic of, uh, I think we all looked, you know, at the end of that session, uh, we were all so frustrated and so miserable uh, that we were kind of looking at the abyss, and uh, we didn't want to we didn't want to spend another session there. Uh, so it, it's an interesting thing. I'd be happy to, in in private, give you more of the dirty details. Um, but uh, you know, so much of this work really is about relationships, and uh, often. When we uh, throw around terms like the urban-rural divide, um, they really are belied when you bring things down to a human sort of level. Now, I, you know, I'm the chair of the Environment and Natural Resources Committee, so you know, I live in a, a very schizophrenic kind of relationship. I mean, you have environment uh, and uh, priorities, you know, as Melissa mentioned, for conservation and uh, environmental quality quality of life, et cetera, uh, and also uh, use and development of our natural resources. And, you know, we uh, find uh, collisions around that happening all the time. Uh, but I myself, uh, representing an urban district where my constituency uh, is um, really, for the most part, kind of ignorant about the natural resources side of what we do as a state and very committed uh, to the environmental side of what we do. Um, I often find myself in a role, um, because I'm chairing the Environment and Natural Resource Committee, you know, of having to uh, be um, uh, the explainer to them of 
what a statewide perspective uh, means. And actually, I think that's something that all our colleagues do. You know, those who represent rural areas uh, are, you know, often in a position where they understand and need to interpret for their constituencies uh, the needs of people in the in the urban area. I think, you know, very often the way to get beyond these stereotypes about urban-rural divide is just bringing people together uh, and, you know, sort of to see the world through each other's eyes. And I had the good fortune when I first became, uh, so I was appointed into the position as chair back in uh, the end of 2013 and then for the 2014 session uh, because I stepped up from the, or stepped over, sorry, from the House to the Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in, uh, uh, right. Maybe just a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so I inherited my predecessor's uh, assignment. Uh, and uh, one of the, um, the first things that I did uh, after getting that assignment was one of the members of my committee at the time was Senator Bill Hansel from Eastern Oregon, a uh, great guy. And uh, he invited me out to his district to spend a couple of days uh, just to kind of see things firsthand. And it was really, I have to say, really eye-opening for me uh, to spend time at the Port of Morrow and uh, to see some of the really exciting uh, economic development that was happening uh, in that part of the, the state on the Columbia River. Uh, and uh, onto the Umatilla Reservation and uh, just meeting uh, with uh, people, uh, seeing the, um, you know, the growth in high value agriculture, but of course the challenges that they faced uh, by not having enough water uh, or a, a reliable, stable water source. And um, so I really, you know, I learned a lot and uh, we, the um, uh, last night that I was there, there was a gathering of local people, and um, there was, uh, I hadn't anticipated that I was going to get grilled by all these local people, and I was Mr. Urban Oregon, uh, you know, on the receiving end of, of a lot of questions. Uh, but one of the questions was, actually specifically about the urban rural divide and it was so how do we get people in Portland to understand the world as we live it uh, and I had no idea how to answer that um, but I quickly thinking on my feet I said well um, you know, every month in my district, I have a constituent coffee, uh, which is something I've done for many years. And, you know, we have uh, 20, 30 people come together, sit around a table, uh, drink coffee, talk about issues. And um, why don't some of you come out to uh, one of these coffees and meet my constituents? And, and they said, that is a great idea. Uh, and we did that. And um, ever since then, we've been kind of going back and forth. Uh, just last year, um, we got a couple of vans uh, and took people from my district back out to Eastern Oregon. Uh, we visited uh, Three Mile Canyon, which is a big uh, dairy farm. Uh, we went on to the Umatilla Reservation. We met with people. Uh, and I have to say, it was really eye-opening for my people. And uh, the same thing happened when uh, people from Hansel's district uh, came over to my coffee and really explained uh, why they need water. And uh, just we had a, a really, really interesting exchange. And what, one of the things that um, I realized was in, in that meeting, I would say half the people who were at that meeting had roots in Eastern Oregon. Either they had come from Eastern Oregon or they had close family connections in Eastern Oregon. And so they, they knew how to see the world through rural eyes, although they were now living in an urban world. And those are the kinds of things I think that we, we really need to build on 
those kinds of exchanges, those kinds of interactions. And we realize that some of those sort of polarized stereotypes kind of fall away. Now let me just very quickly uh, mention a few of the, uh, the bills that we passed this session that I think kind of exemplify that. Uh, you've heard already, you heard uh, Caddy McEwen this morning talk about the big transportation package uh, that we passed. And you know, what's interesting is of the four co-chairs of the, you know, the, the group that steered that legislation, uh, none of them was from Portland. Uh, three of them were from rural parts of the state. Uh, only one, uh, Lee Byer from Springfield, was from an urban area. Uh, and I think they really came up with a program that did look statewide. But one of the interesting things that they heard as they took their road shows around the state was um, concern in the rural parts of the state about traffic problems in Portland, in the Portland area, uh, because they had to get their goods to market, they had to get their goods to the port, and they were getting stalled in Portland. So the idea that people in, I mean, we, we often hear, we in urban uh, Oregon, uh, hear about the need to support rural Oregon. And I think when it's really explained to people, they do. But, um, you know, here it was kind of the reverse, uh, that uh, rural uh, people really having a stake in transportation issues in, in Portland. Uh, and I thought that was, uh, you know, really very interesting. Um, we, uh, you know, as you heard, um, one of the accomplishments uh, we, of the um, session is, at least for now, we seem to be on track to keep the Elliott State Forest public. And what was really noteworthy about that is, as you can imagine, that was a big issue for people in my district. You know, people who are environmentalists, they want to keep the Elliott uh, uh, public. But what was really interesting about the session was hearing how strong the support for that was from people in Melissa's area uh, down in Coos Bay. Uh, adjacent to the Elliott, uh, that keeping, finding a path to keeping the Elliott public was really important to them. And uh, believe me, that made our work a lot easier this session, both in creating the legislation to make trust land transfers possible, and then to come up with the initial funding uh, to help with that. Um, the, uh, you know, the one of the bills that I mentioned uh, earlier that I partnered with Senator Gerard on uh, is um, opening up uh, mining resources in uh, frontier Oregon. And uh, this, I think, was, um, uh, it was a very interesting process that lasted uh, much of the session. Uh, we started early in the session. Uh, Fred and I partnered on a bill uh, that uh, regulates suction dredge mining uh, in the in-stream mining uh, in, the, in the state to, to make sure it doesn't happen in areas where there's vulnerable uh, fish, uh, endangered species habitat. Um, but through that work, uh, we, uh, that, that led to our working together on how to um, uh, exploit what are potentially very significant resources in frontier Oregon, uh, an area that's very challenged uh, economically. Um, and where there seems to be a potential for significant uh, resources kind of coming up from Nevada, uh, that same sort of uh, uh, area. Uh, how, how, can we, how can we do that in a way that is environmentally responsible, but uh, where all of the environmental and public health uh, uh, I's and T's are, are dotted and crossed, but doing it in a more streamlined manner uh, so that um, the permitting can all happen in a consolidated upfront manner uh, in which uh, there, there are assurances that uh, things like sage grouse habitat is respected and you know things that need to be done. And uh, at the end of the day, I think uh, we, uh, we ended up with something that uh, really has a, a lot of potential, and it ended up uh, getting really broad bipartisan support uh, at the end of the session. Uh, finally, let me just say that uh, one of the uh, pieces of unfinished business but ongoing work 
as many of you know, uh, is um, looking at uh, developing a carbon pricing program uh, for Oregon, um, something along the lines of uh, cap and invest. And um, you know, many of us are are um, you know committed to working on this. Certainly, because you know we understand uh, the challenges of climate change, and uh, you know, to be honest, the extreme consequences for rural Oregon of uh, the effects of of climate change. Uh, but um, the challenge of how to do it in a way that actually builds Oregon's economy, particularly rural economies, uh, in terms of um, uh, investments in uh, alternative energy uh, sources, which, going back to that Moro mi miracle that I learned about in my first trip uh, into uh, Hansel's district, you know, a lot of that miracle is due to investments in alternative energies. Um, so how do we do that um, in a way that is uh, actually good for Oregon's economy, and particularly its rural economy, uh, through the use of direct investments and also offsets. Uh, the Warm Springs have already been the beneficiaries of um, uh, offsets through the California program. Uh, we should be using Oregon resources uh, to be able to invest in those strategies as well. The thing is, <clears throat> none of that can happen if uh, people in Salem design a program uh, without direct involvement of people from our rural communities. And so as we um, pursue this, and we're going to be working on it over the next few months, um, <clears throat> we are going to be looking at it uh, in terms of a number of different focuses, you know, one directly on uh, agriculture and forestry and uh, rural economies. And we want to make sure that we have uh, people from the rural areas directly involved in that, including from the tribes, uh, utilities, uh, energy intensive uh, industries. Uh, impacted communities, communities of color, and you know those who are really going to be challenged if we do this, who are, who are challenged by climate change, but who would be really, who could potentially be really harmed if we do this wrong, right? Because people in rural areas are very dependent on energy. I mean, you know, they tend to drive longer distances. Uh, they uh, they may have more extreme kinds of weather that they're living in. Uh, if, if we do this in a way that's just going to increase their costs, uh, that is going to be a real mistake. So again, the answer to this is going to be getting people together, work, seeing the challenges through one another's eyes, and doing the hard work. And I think that's what we're committed to doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Please raise your hands if you have a hard time hearing. That's the easiest thing to do. I, I got the signal from Senator Cruz that we were having a hard time for a moment. Thank you. He just didn't like what I was saying. <laughs> Representative Helm. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I've been told in the past that I don't have enough of an outdoor voice. That, and so, if, again, if you can't hear, raise your hand and I'll speak up. Um, on, on the issue of how we communicate with each other, um, between the rural and urban areas. Um, I like to make sure that I have a foot in both worlds, because I really do. Um, I grew up in what could best be described as a sagebrush subdivision just south of Bend. Um, and that was when the city of Bend had two mills, uh, and we didn't have any driving circles. Um, and it truly was an agricultural and timber city and you all know how it's translated itself into an outdoor recreation mecca so uh, so much so that it's probably loving itself to death right now uh, through tourism um, I my parents still live there and I'm contemplating well I'm planning to go with my children to their house for the eclipse and so that's all well and good but I still haven't figured out my secret route to forgetting uh, between Salem and Bend without going on one of the major highways. 
But uh, that's an example of, of uh, one of the challenges that we have as we translate um, from uh, 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 natural resource intensive economies to a mix of different uh, economic uh, strategies. Um, I wanted to uh, highlight uh, th three bills and a couple of pieces of undone business, um, and then I'll let other folks talk. Um, the bills represent, I think, uh, small but significant um, steps in the way we work together um, throughout the state. Um, and before I go into that, I just want to say from, from my perspective in the House of Representatives and the, as the chair of the Committee on Energy and Environment, there was a palpable sense this session, and, very, uh, and, and I agreed with it, to make room for the transportation package. Make sure that we got it done. And therefore, aspirations for some other bills were uh, not set aside so much, but given secondary emphasis. And I thought that was the right thing to do because the transportation package benefits the whole state, and sometimes in ways that we wouldn't anticipate uh, immediately. So that being said, these three bills may seem small, but they will have uh, positive impacts, and um, they're good models for us. The first is a program that we reauthorized and um, refund, uh, funded again, uh, in a, and remember in a very tight budget situation, that funds, um, uh, helps folks uh, analyze and fix their septic systems. And you may know that around the state, in certain parts of the state, we have water tables that are very vulnerable to septic systems that happen to be failing or malfunctioning. And many, in many of those places, um, they're populated by folks that don't have a ton of money to undertake those fixes, and the fixes are expensive. So uh, a number of years ago, we established a program that set some state money up um, to be matched, if possible, with private funds and uh, would, would provide a mechanism by which folks could tap into uh, a funding stream to get their septic system checked out and then fixed. That worked so well that we decided to do it again. It turns out that we are able to uh, leverage the state money by three or four times and get private money in the door to do the same thing. That is, and, and that is an example of a, a program where the private sector is doing most of the work Government has set up the money and some monitoring and stepped out of the way. Uh, and we're going to get a lot of good things done. And I very much hope that we're able to leverage even more private money toward that work uh, with this reauthorization. The second was uh, a, a program that would allow um, wood product waste to come out of the forest and to be used, either pelletized or otherwise used, um, to create cleaner, not green energy under definition, but cleaner energy um, in our rural areas to be used in boilers and so forth um, for public buildings. Um, and that means schools, that means other public buildings. Uh, the existing law allowed about 1.5 percent of uh, public building financing to go toward clean or green energy uh, production. Typically in the past that has been geothermal and solar. and uh, we had a bill that came over from the Senate, um, again, a bipartisan type of, of bill um, led by uh, Senator Knope. Uh, it came over to my committee and met resistance. And the reason it met resistance is it had met resistance for the three or four previous long sessions because it was viewed that this type of energy generation is not quite clean enough, not quite green enough. Um, but I saw things differently. I saw this as a way to acknowledge that we had moved along in technology and that we had abundant resources in um, the timber growing parts of the state that were underutilized and that we could make use of in this way uh, and, and forge a little bit of progress on a very important topic, which is how do we wring the last bit of value out of our forests after we've gotten the saw logs out? How do we use that slash? And this is a way. And it is a small step, but I think an important step as we go forward. The third is, uh, again, harkens back to the way that communities like Bend and Oak Ridge, Joseph, 
sisters have been changing their economies over time to rely more on tourism. And I was invited to chief sponsor a bill with Representative Mark Johnson that created an Office of Outdoor Recreation. And it is going to be, it was intended to be and will be, uh, the primary touch point for the outdoor recreation industry um, to have a voice in the, inside state agencies and with the legislature. This was very much wanted and brought to us by the outdoor recreation industry, both in the state and nationally. And you would recognize many of the names of the companies that we worked with in getting this legislation done. As we do that, we can leverage what is nationally and in the state a huge industry, huge. Um, and we have not yet begun to tap its potential, even though as Oregonians and as the friendly visitors that like to come and do the things that I like to do, like whitewater rafting and fly fishing, mountain biking, um, we wring some money out of them when they come to visit. and. It is a relatively low impact way to do that for our state and generate tax revenues. So here's some unfinished business. The biggest piece is that we still have not figured out how to adequately fund our natural resources agencies, in particular um, our Department of uh, Fish and Wildlife. And there are folks in this room, including myself, that worked very hard to try to figure that out in the interim uh, uh, after uh, tw uh, 2015. We have declining sales of uh, fishing licenses and hunting licenses over time. It's a trend that we anticipate will continue. Yet the department does many, many important things that props up our, our economy, especially in rural areas. We were not able to push forward a bill that helped figure out how to fund that, even though we had some great ideas and a task force that worked extremely hard in the interim uh, to generate those ideas. That's, for me, that's unfinished business. It's really important business, and it's indicative of the way we treat our natural resources agencies in this state. And I think it's a particular challenge for us that are concerned with rural communities, because folks in the state tend to forget, I think, that those natural resource agencies are also economic development agencies, because they monitor, they help, and they regulate our natural resources industries. And those industries need permits that they can rely on, not ones that are vulnerable to litigation, that are shoddy, and not go out the door too quick because we don't have enough agency staff to do them correctly. And I, uh, I'll rant again here, as I did on the floor at the end of the session. We need more general fund money for our natural resources agencies to serve the state better. And we fall down session after session after session in doing so. Um, so there's more uh, work to be done there to put our brains against this problem, get it fixed. Second unfinished business is that uh, we've talked about water uh, for a long, long time in this state. Um, and uh, I reinitiated a conversation about water this session. And I introduced three bills that uh, all of which um, didn't go anywhere. One of them didn't go anywhere because we asked for money that wasn't available for groundwater studies. The two others didn't go anywhere because after talking with folks that know a lot more than I do about water, and remember I studied water law when I was in law school and followed it throughout my career, it's so complex that it needs more time to work on. Um, and even though we got close to some legislation that would have required some form of reporting out on the landscape, I felt that we weren't done with that work, and so I pulled the plug on it. And I thought that was a good decision. Um, and I'll keep working on it. So uh, for those of you who got the calls that I probably generated through these bills saying, well, are you talking about putting a fee on my domestic water well? No, we weren't. But we'll keep talking about how we better manage water. And when we do that, we really help prop up and make more stable those parts of the state that rely both on surface water and groundwater for their livelihood. And uh, I'll be working on that in the future as well. Thanks. Thank you, Representative Helm. Next up, we have Jim Rue from the Department of Land Conservation and Development. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you um, for the invitation to speak. Um, how many people from Oregon? Well, no, let's do it the other way. How many people not from Oregon in the room? 
Okay, very few. You can catch them later. Um, we'll catch them later. Um, I, I do want to spend, <clears throat> excuse me, just a moment um, talking about the state's land use planning system uh, because it goes directly to this issue of development and conservation. Um, we have a system um, that is somewhat unique in the country. Uh, we also don't have a system that often exists elsewhere in the country. So most states do an environmental impact assessment or environmental impact process for development. We do not have such a process here. Um, in 1973, uh, we had a group of people in the legislature who said, let's do it a different way. Let's try to set the table so that every community is ready for development all the time. Uh, great aspiration. We're not quite there yet, uh, but, but that is the plan. Uh, the plan is that communities have economic development and housing lands sufficient for a 20-year time horizon. Um, and it, it is the economic development side of that, that that I want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about. Um, when communities have land that is available for jobs, uh, and that land is serviced, so-called shovel-ready and ready to go, uh, they are then ready for new employment opportunities in their communities. When they don't have that money, they're not. Um, and so one of the critical asks, and I just want to spend a moment whining about what Rep Helm just said, he told you that natural resource agencies are underfunded. Uh, 14 natural resources agencies collectively get about 1% of the general fund. And so one of the places that's underfunded is the grants to local governments that allow them to do the planning to get that industrial land. So I'm going to stop the, the sort of negative side there and, and spend just a couple of minutes talking about some success stories. We're going to start in the far eastern part of the state with Malheur County. Um, a, a, a county that has changed dramatically. Um, so I'm kind of an old timer, third generation Oregonian, but when I was a, at Boys State many, many, many years ago, uh, my roommate uh, was uh, from Ontario. And he uh, was from a community that was one of the richest in the state of Oregon uh, because of incredible farmland and a very productive agriculture industry at the time. Their world has changed. The agriculture is still there, but there's a community called Boise, Idaho, about an hour away, and we know what happens to rural communities when larger metropolitan areas start to suck all of the energy toward the center. All of the commercial, educational, health care, everything else goes to the center, and so today, Malheur County is a very different place, or at least the cities of Nyssa, Vale, and Ontario are a different place than they were a lot of years ago. I'm not going to tell you how many. Um, so we spent a bunch of time three years ago working with the county to try to set aside some industrial land. Uh, we added a couple of hundred acres to each of the communities of Nyssa and Vale, and nearly 500 acres to the community of Ontario. One of the, the projects that got done in this legislative session was a so-called transload facility. Um, as many of you probably know, we don't do a lot of export uh, out of the Port of Portland anymore. And so much of the agricultural production needs to go either up to Seattle-Tacoma or, or a, a little bit of it down to San Francisco. Um, getting that produce, that product, to Seattle-Tacoma is way cheaper if you can do it with a train than with a truck. And so this transload facility will allow a hub to be developed on industrial land, probably south of Ontario, uh, where the farmers can bring in their, their product, uh, transfer it off of a truck onto a rail system, and get it to market cheaper than they have been in the last three or four or five years. So that's one success. Uh, a second one kind of builds off of uh, something else that Rep Helm said, and that is um, we have forests that are growing to maturity pretty much across the state right now. Um, and 
the ability to get wood out of those forests uh, has been facilitated by uh, an agreement that the Department of Forestry has worked out uh, with the federal government, and that is that the state can actually do management on federal lands. It's a very big deal uh, because it gets a lot of deferred management underway. But once we get that material out of the woods, we have to have, and in many cases, rebuild the infrastructure uh, to get it processed. Uh, we've been working with Lake County in, in south, south Central Oregon uh, to uh, develop uh, something called Red Rock Fuels. It's bio engine or, or bio jet fuel. Um, developed by uh, an investment from the Defar Department of Defense, but also uh, some commercial airlines showing some interest. Uh, we had to make sure, again, that there was sufficient industrial land available. It is now there, uh, and Red Rock is in the final stages, we hope, of getting their financing, and we hope to see them break ground very soon. The last one I'm going to talk about, uh, because I think it's probably one of the most exciting developments that is going on around the state right now, um, is an industrial land expansion um, in the community of Scapoose. Um, we actually approved it, our commission uh, approved it probably five years ago. And one of the big issues that we, uh, we talk about a lot is the delaying effect of appeals. Uh, that, that expansion was in fact in the Court of Appeals for in excess of two years. But the area is now being developed and um, it is the new home uh, of the Oregon Manufacturing in, uh, Innovation Center. Um, a, a collaboration between Boeing and the, the essentially the higher ed system uh, in the state of Oregon. What I hope can happen is that we'll not just be working uh, doing fine metallurgy, uh, but also be able to, to develop some materials science expertise in, in the area of cross-laminated timber. Um, there are two projects underway in the city of, of Portland right now that are using CLT materials to build what would have at one time been almost exclusively concrete. Uh, they're demonstration projects, but uh, it may well be that the, uh, the, the future market for, for CLT could be immense, um, and that means one more use for some of that uh, wood uh, coming out of our forests. Um, so, actually, I'm just going to stop. Um, that, that, that's enough. <laughs> Thank you, Director Rue. <laughs> Next up, we have Ed Finley from the U.S. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency, Office of Sustainable Communities. Okay. Well, thank you, Melissa, and thanks, everybody, again, for the opportunity to uh, be with you. Uh, so I've got some observations for you. The first observation is that how and where we live has a profound effect on the environment and how and where we develop land has a profound effect. Jim Rue made reference to this and the fact that uh, the state of Oregon is uh, not only an innovator but, but really um, unique in this country in uh, its early recognition of that and its smart ways in pursuing it. Smart if continuing to, uh, you know, if you're continuing to find your way. The second um, observation I would make is that there is a pronounced market trend, meaning what people want, that favors walkable, compact, amenity-rich, mixed-use communities. Uh, the realtor surveys will tell you this, land values will tell you this, your millennial child will tell you this. Uh, the third observation is that this market trend uh, I think originally was most noticed or even particularly pronounced in urban areas, but now we can see it across different communities in this country. Um, it continues to be a pronounced trend in urban areas. Um, you can see that out the window here. But what I think is most interesting and potentially of, of interest to those of us working in rural communities is that this is a pronounced uh, trend in small towns and rural communities. This, this interest in main streets, in traditionally built compact and mixed use places of which there are plenty in this country, including in this region. So um, another observation is that investment patterns have followed this social trend. 
Okay, so as people have chosen, um, you know, as people have this preference for this type of living, we've seen that investment has follows, and that that's not just residential uh, land values, but it's also um, the workforce, and it's also how corporate America is investing, and it's also how people who work, uh, whether they're self-employed or are job creators, where they, um, you know, set up shop. So uh, on the corporate side, we've seen a movement towards compact mixed-use areas, uh, uh, including in smaller towns. But also what I would invite you to think about is what people who can have a portable job or create their own job are doing. And what we have seen, and again, this is a pronounced trend across the country, is that people will choose to, will choose the place to live and then find out the job or create the job once they get there. And that's not to say that everybody has the luxury of being in such a position or has the ambition to be in such a position. But again, it's a trend. We've seen many more people who will find the place and then you know, decide on what they will do. And that is different than before. So the sum of all this is that I would offer an observation on what gives small towns and rural communities a competitive advantage. The first is cherishing and building on those traditional, uh, or for that matter, new, compact, mixed-use, walkable places. And again, whether it's a, a, a traditional Main Street or you know a newly developed community that meets that trend, that's a tremendous asset regardless of community size. The second thing I want to throw in there, and I haven't said the, the, the word so far, but Senator McCoy in the last session talked a lot about it. And this really is a game changer, and I think of importance for rural communities and small towns is broadband. Okay, so, you know, in, in talking about this amenity rich, you know, the, the, the asset of an amenity rich good place to be, broadband is part of that. But what's interesting about broadband is, it, it kind of does double duty uh, in, in my experience. It is a utility. It is a necessary utility for our modern economy, just like electricity, water, and other traditional utilities are. Okay, and if you don't have it, you know, that takes you, you know, out of play for many, if not most, or all modern industries. But the second thing we can think about is broadband as an amenity. As people have a place, you know, for those people and those investors who have a choice in where to go, you know, having not only the, the bare minimum of broadband, uh, but something that is, um, you know, particularly, um, you know, uh, well-priced and, and broad, you know, that's an advantage. And we've seen investors go, including to smaller communities, when you have those things. So, I'll I'll uh, I'll, I'll stop there. But again, just just to say that what I find particularly interesting is that those trends and those competitive advantages. Um, there is no reason that small towns and rural communities can't take advantage of them, and in fact, even take advantage of them uh, in ways beyond the capabilities of urban areas. Thank you very much, Ed. Next up, we have Kevin Werner, the director of NOAA's Northwest Fisheries Science Center. Great. Thanks, Melissa, and thanks, everyone, for the opportunity to be here. Um, I wanted to talk about a, a different kind of divide. Um, there's a lot of talk about the urban-rural divide. Um, I'm, I want to talk about the divide between science and, and, and policy. And so I'm going to start out with a question. How many people in the room would, would characterize themselves as a scientist? So more than I thought. That's a, that's a lot. Um, so I wanted to um, sort of get there by talking a little bit about my background and, and where I am. So as I, I mentioned before, I, I work for, for NOAA now, but my 
um, background is I, I, I started in graduate school as a climate scientist doing global circulation models, interested in climate change, and, and I was really interested in sort of the application of what we were learning and, and from the science into policy making, and, and I didn't really see an avenue for doing that in academia. So I looked around and I, and I saw this agency, NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, whose mission is to do that sort of application, that connection of the science to, 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 to decision making. Um, so that was 18 years ago. Um, fast forward 18 years, I've, I've had experience working, um, connecting forecasts to decision making in water resources, primarily in the Colorado River Basin. I, I worked on President Obama's Sandy um, re Rebuilding Task Force, looking at how to infuse science into the rebuilding efforts on the Atlantic coast after Hurricane Sandy. Um, I've, I've worked at, um, now I'm at fisheries, and, and I've been, I'm only here two months, so I, I don't know it um, all that well. Somebody said deer in headlights, that's kind of the mode I'm in. But in fisheries, we, we have a science center that, that is um, that's, that's designed to provide science to, for the management and protection of, of our marine species. Um, and so sort of looking at those collective experiences, um, I, I pulled out some, some lessons learned from, from my, my experience in, in this world. The first is that science agencies and scientists are generally disconnected from management, policy, decision making. Um, if you look at sort of how we're organized, we've got academia, um, we've got science agencies at the federal level where we, we, we have people with scientists working with other scientists doing really good science, um, but not necessarily connecting what they do to to policy um, as effectively as they could be. And I'm, and I'm not suggesting that, that we should go up and, and sort of make every scientist a, a, a science for policy science scientist. I think there's a lot of value in, in maintaining um, some some core science capabilities where you have scientists working with science scientists to do science. Um, but I, I am suggesting that, that we, we don't have a strong function in, in connecting that science, translating both ways between science and policy making as, as we could. Um, so that, that's one observation. Um, second observation, when I talk to scientists, I, I, I like to say that you know, the, 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 the decision making is highly complex, especially in the policy world that a lot of you all work in, and I know you don't need me to tell you that. Um, but if you're, if you're thinking about how to make your science relevant in that policy world, I think it's important to understand that, that both the, the complexity of the decision making pl process, but also that there's people at the center of, of, of all of these processes. And, and people have their own biases, their own agendas, their own interests. And again, I don't need to tell you all this. But what I think is maybe interesting to think about is the reverse. And, and thinking about if you're trying to influence science and scientists and the, their, their work, there are also people, and they also have their own agenda and their own biases, and, 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 and thinking about how to put a, a, a policy question on the table that has science relevance and, and how to steer the science that you need or want to, to inform your decision making, I think it's important to think about the, the organizations that are doing the science and how to influence them as well, because they are also human-centric, and there are people at the, at the core of all those decisions that, that have their own, as I said, biases and agendas. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is, um, when I talk to scientists, is, is you, you can lead a horse to the water, um, but you're not always going to be successful in making the horse drink. So you can do all the relationship building, all the understanding of, of, of how, you, how you want to inform, um, you know, bring your science or bring your, your information, data, whatever, to, to the table. But you're not always going to be successful in, in, in seeing it um, have the policy relevant outcome that, that you're looking for. Um, and, and I say this because I, 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 I don't want, um, I think it's important not to give up. It's a long-term process, it's iterative, it requires long-term relationship building to be successful. Um, so I think, you know, just that, that's why I'm here. I'm here to sort of build relationships, get to know you all, and I'm, I'm hoping that this is the beginning of, of doing that for, for me. And that's where I'm going to leave it. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Next up, we have Richard Whitman, the director of the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to try to convey three things to you today uh, in, in for you to think about as part of this conference and, and, and uh, go home and hopefully think about some more. The first is place matters. And the second is we need urban and rural interests to work together for solutions. And the third is what works in one place won't necessarily work in others. So I want to talk about each of those in uh, the context of two quick examples. And I'm gonna, I am going to try to be fast here. 
the first is um, uh, with regard to infrastructure. Now, when you think about DEQ, you might not think about infrastructure, but part of our infrastructure is, in addition to roads, uh, wastewater and water infrastructure. And the example that I want to use comes to us from Central Oregon. And so how did urban and rural interest intersect there, or how do they intersect there? We have the city of Bend. We heard earlier it's the fastest growing area in the state of Oregon. It's making significant demands on water resources. That's putting stress on a river and on water quality and on fish. We also have uh, that area, some of the highest value added agriculture in the state of Oregon in irrigation districts. And finally, uh, we have a number of endangered species, including the spotted frog, as well as several, several uh, fishery species. So that area has come together, and we have irrigation districts leading the way, working with citizens, working with the city of Bend, to put together a program where through investments in infrastructure, in this case, in terms of water use efficiency, we can leave more water in stream so that we have better water quality and so that we have better habitat for the species that depend on them. That's, that's a solution that uh, really demonstrates how the urban people in the city of Bend are actually dependent on the rural folks in those irrigation districts for the holistic solution to how to manage water in that basin. Um, I think that's uh, the type of holistic solution that we need to be working uh, to find across the state. The second example I want to use uh, to really illustrate what works in one place doesn't necessarily work in another is on the regulatory side, and, and that is how most people uh, think about the Department of Environmental Quality. We are Part of our mission is to protect public health, and, and fundamentally, we need to assure Oregonians that public health is protected. We're currently in the midst of developing a new program around industrial air toxics called Cleaner Air Oregon that was launched by Governor Brown about a year ago. And uh, Governor Brown has, has, has uh, uh, stated certain key principles that we need to, to meet for this program. We need to assure the public that we're protecting public health. We also need to um, provide a framework for our business community so that they have some predictability about what is required, what's not required. They know what the rules of the game are, and they can act accordingly. Um, so how does that play out on the ground? Well, uh, uh, here in Portland, where we have, as we've just talked about a little bit, um, uh, a lot of density, um, mixed use, um, a lot of business and transportation facilities that are right next to residential neighborhoods, we have uh, significant imp health impacts on our communities in this urban area because the density and the number of people and the amount of activity that we have in the area. So we need solutions for the Portland area that deal with those emissions and deal with our existing uh, business community in a way that doesn't drive business away, but that protects folks in those communities. So what about, um, what about a small community on the coast that has a single lumber mill? Uh, and, you know, that lumber mill provides many of the jobs for that community. There, while we still have to be worried about the public health impacts of emissions from that facility, the values are going to be different. It, that community is completely dependent on that, or maybe completely dependent on that industry. And so what works in the city of Portland won't necessarily work in that community. So again, on this living life on the uh, razor's edge of the urban-rural divide, we need to recognize as part of that that what works in some communities won't necessarily work in others. And we need to design our programs so that they keep that in mind. When I was uh, Jim Roo's predecessor in DLCD, and I can't resist doing this. Jim knows what I'm going to say. Um, we continually are berated in our land use program about one size does not fit all. That's also true of our regulatory programs. And just as the land use program 
has and is adapting to provide room for local governments to make their own decisions about what their communities should look like. We're doing the same thing in the regulatory sphere. Thanks very much. Thank you, Richard. Next up, we have Senator Lou Frederick. Oh, yeah, Thanks. Okay. You guys found a spot. Thank, Thank you. you. We found, found a spot. Thank you very much. I'm going to be, uh, I'll try to be as short as possible, um, but I wanted to start off by, I'll um, play off what, what Richard just was talking about. One of my colleagues in the legislature, Greg Barreto, was uh, giving a presentation with me one day, and uh, he mentioned that he was from Cove, Oregon. How many of you ever been to Cove? Oh, pretty cool. And he mentioned that Cove has about 600 people in Cove. And I mentioned to him that right down the street from me, an, an apartment complex opened up with 680 units. <laughs> um, it was, uh, that's, that's so the one size fits all com conversation really does, you really do have to adjust it in many ways. But I'm going to go back to another story, and that is that's from the late, late 70s, early 80s. Uh, I got a chance to be a television reporter for 17 years. I was the science reporter for Channel 8. And um, I got a chance to know and, and meet uh, uh, Tom McCall many times. One of the things that stu stood, st stayed with me as he talked about things was he was concerned that there was no longer a family connection between the folks in Portland and the folks in the rest of the state that we did not have a situation where people were having Thanksgiving dinner with Uncle George. Uh, even though you really argued with Uncle George constantly, you still had a family connection with him, and you had a respect for what Uncle George was doing out in the woods or in the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the ocean or, or in the fields somewhere. Um, that change, that, is, that has continued. That was a, that's still uh, a part of what I, what I try to deal with. So what I see as part of my mission is to try to find some way to, to get that reconnection. And part of that reconnection problem right now is one of trust. Uh, we have a lot of, we have made, a lot of people have made a lot of promises to each other, and the concern is that we are not holding up to those promises. And they involve everything from, uh, from how, how we're going to support transportation, getting, getting goods and services to, uh, to and from or Oregon, uh, because my district is the hub for that. For that. Um, the airport, the, the, two, the uh, two freeways, uh, 205 and I-5, all the railroads, the, uh, the river, all the, the Columbia and the Willamette, all go through my district. Uh, so I, uh, that's, that's part of what, I, what I'm concerned about. But there's an, other promises that we've made that include things like some of the cattlemen are concerned about regarding uh, how we deal with predator control uh, and other issues that we made promises about uh, in the past that, uh, and, and a sense of trust that we need to uh, deal with and a sense of predictability. That's the, those are the concerns that I'm working on. I'm the co-chair of the um, Ways and Means Subcommittee on Natural Resources. That has 14 different natural resources um, agencies under it. And ma in many cases, people do not know what those agencies do. Um, my other background is molecular biology, uh, among other things. My other background is I was a, a ranch hand in Nebraska. So I have a, 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 a really ra a real range of things to, to deal with, and I think we need to recognize that we can no longer rely on either family connections or media to give you a sense of what's really going on out there. And that's the kind of thing that I think we need to, we, each of you, all of us, need to find a way to work with. And if I can um, ask that, there one, that one thing take place, it is that we begin that process or continue that process to reconnect uh, all of Oregon uh, with one another uh, because we don't have that connection right now. And it's easy to, to separate people. It's much harder to bring people together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. And our last speaker is Representative David Brock Smith. So finally, <clears throat> can everybody hear me okay? So now we get to the rural. I saw a lot more rural hands out here than, than, uh, than we did urban. Uh, but before I get started, I want to give a shout out to Karen Chase. I see her because uh, she really assisted in, in a, just a life-changing rural economic development project back in 2012-2013 as a commissioner in Curry County. I was fortunate to work with my colleague David Itson and it was the Rehome Oregon project that took dilapidated manufactured homes away 
and offered a three million dollar investment for folks and it was driven by the health uh, uh, the health study in the county that was able to replace these old dilapidated homes and change people's lives and in doing so the energy savings alone uh, from the uh, dilapidated homes and and the, the failing roofs really paid for the majority of the new mortgage at a uh, fixed low rate so Karen thank you so much as always so. um, you know I'm fortunate to work with uh, these two colleagues on um, I'm on the House Energy and Environment Committee but also with land use I'm on the Ag and Natural Resources Committee in the House as well as the Vice Chair of Economic Development and Trade and so land use and and I represent Southwest Oregon from Charleston to the California border over to West Cape Junction up I-5 uh, towards uh, West Roseburg uh, which is really a fish farm forestry district that has been forced into shifting into a tourism driven economy and I'm here to tell you we can't survive on walking trails and we can't do it uh, uh, without utilizing our natural resources we can't res we can't survive as a retirement communities and districts and so when it comes to land use you know my brother is, lives in Hillsboro and I see farmland in Portland being converted to uh, a, you know 600 multi apartment complexes but when we try to build a golf course in Curry County the environmental community comes out of the woodwork and we have to pass special legislation and I thank you again senator um, to carve out to, uh, I, I thank him very much. Yeah, um, I'll tell you the backstory. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not packing today. <laughs> okay. um, it's a funny story. Uh, but we have to sp we have to pass special uh, uh, legislation just to carve out 27 acres because of ex existing laws wouldn't allow it to revert back uh, to uh, farmland because it never had any water on it in the first place. Um, and so then when we talk about land use, and, and I'll just use Curry County because I'm most familiar, um, when 1,648 square miles in Curry County and 67% is federally owned, 22% is farmland, 7% is, is uh, excuse me, 22% is private forest, 7% is farm, 1% is state, that only leaves roughly 4% of economically developable, buildable land and when you have 4% that the majority has houses, you can't grow because you have goal 18 that deals with the coastal edge and you have a highway that goes through it, through Highway 101. And so uh, there, and then when you add the federal policies such as FEMA's new National Flood Insurance Program and, and our district, my district has a number of wetlands and rivers and streams and now that land is being mitigated uh, are having to be mitigated for any type of building, you keep on restricting down any type of ability to grow. And so when you look at the, the possibilities with regards to cross-laminated timber and the fact that, you know, I, I believe that CLT is the future of the wood products industry and there's a fantastic framework project. Where's Lynn? There he is. Uh, fantastic frameworks project that's moving forward in the Pearl District up here in Portland and it's being moved and and that material is going to come from uh, DR Johnson Mill in Riddle Oregon but they only have access to half the lumber necessary to build it and there's lots I've talked to a number of the mills around uh, around the state of Oregon and they would love and they're ready to convert into a CN CLT manufacturing but there's two problems one they're waiting for the push for the build and two they have no security with regards to supply in order to make the investment and so we need to shift the attitude when it comes to the rural urban divide uh, with regards to our natural resource uh, use uh, when the same is uh, true with our aggregate we have a situation where we just passed a fantastic transportation package Portland needs to have the expansion of the road infrastructure because trust me my brother lives in Hillsborough I've been driving in every morning and I gotta leave at 630 to get here and it's only and it's only 15 miles uh, but in doing so you're gonna need rock and aggregate to build those roads and replace those bridges well it isn't gonna come from here it's gonna come from my district 
And I have rivers and streams that are plugged with aggregate that we have issues with with regards to our Samanid fisher, you know, our fisheries that we need to clean out because dams have been built and the floods that would naturally clean them out won't happen. And there's a bill that Ken and I are going to work on to make sure that happens next, next go around. <laughs> um, so that we can protect our fishery because you, you can't have man, you, you can't have man intervene here and then expect not to deal with the consequences later. Um, and, and when we talk about emissions and climate change, I completely understand or I try to understand Portland's issues when it comes to clean air. But when, and, and I appreciated uh, Director Whitman's comments uh, with regards to you can't have a one size fit all uh, situation because in, in my neck of the woods we have the cleanest air in the state. Of course the wind blows quite a bit but but we do have the cleanest air in the state. So to punish, and I say punish because you're going to be taxing or causing an increase in the cost of doing business, to folks in my district, to pay for clean air in Portland isn't the way to go. And I'm going, and so we'll be having those conversations as we move forward um, with that. And, and just so, and, and you said you had a very tough short session, so I hope we don't have a cap and trade conversation in the short session because that would just make another tough short session uh, coming up. But uh, lastly, when we talk about, uh, well, I just want one more point there. When it comes to sustainable forest management and those timber resources, the emissions that rural Oregon is putting, causing, is the, the emissions that are coming from our wildfires because of the the uh, mismanagement of our timber resources. And so we have to have an overall conversation about how these resources work together. You have to put the emotional argument away and let's use data-driven science when it comes to these conversations and I look forward to working with my colleagues. And then lastly, um, as you heard earlier, uh, when it comes to the rural urban issues, you know, when it comes to the Elliott, and I have just a little piece in my district, you know, here we spend $100 million in saving the Elliott State Forest. And yet in Curry County, in South Curry County, we have a disease that has ravaged the, the, the forest in Sudden Oak Death. We have a new EU1 strain that is uh, affecting Douglas fir. It's, it's taken away the, the uh, um, the, the main food source, which is the, the tan oak acorn, from the ecosystem, and yet we can't fund the strategic plan that's necessary to stop the spread of the EU1 strain and halt the spread of the NA1, which is going to devastate the timber economy, devastate the Port of Coos Bay, and all the millions of state investments there. So when we have these conversations moving forward, a balanced approach is necessary because it's frustrating when we're talking about a forest like the Elliott, which the forest that is in that is in peril down in southern Oregon has a heck of a lot better resources than the Elliott State Forest does. And so there needs to be a balance there. And I look forward to working with my colleagues and all of you and getting that done. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Smith. All right, we have a couple minutes for questions. Does anybody have anything burning in their mind that they want to hear about before they go to lunch? No? Look at you guys. All right, we answered all your questions. Have a, have a great lunch. Thank you.